Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Chris McCausland. the cheaper option, but I still appreciate you've made the choice. <laughs> uh, this is the first week of the, the third and final leg of this tour, which um, was meant to start in 2020, and it got like rearranged and rearranged and rearranged, and it started in 2022, which means that the people at the beginning of the tour that saw me last year. Some of those people, by the time they got to see me live and had tickets for like well over two years, how do you live up to that kind of expectations? <laughs> you have tickets for two years to see Madonna at a bush. <laughs> do you know how ridiculous it was? I had tickets to see Guns N' Roses at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium last July, and I had them for two and a half years which was the same length of time that some people had tickets to see me at Swindon Art Centre. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like, all oh, these tickets were on the sale last year, which feels a lot more reasonable for everybody, clearly, doesn't it? I've been like, I've been trying to, because uh, it, it's, a, it's a long tour. It kept on getting longer and longer. I, be, I felt like I was chasing the middle of this tour. Fucking ages. <laughs> I just kept on adding them on to the end. I've been trying to keep myself fit for it and stuff. Uh, at home. I don't go to the gym for loads of reasons. I won't bore you with them all here. I, I think I'd say the main reason I don't go to the gym, if I'm honest with you, I feel like a little bit of a health and safety nightmare in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for equal opportunities. I'm all for access for all. But if they were to come out tomorrow and say from now on we've decided the blind people are banned from going to the gym on their own, I think I'd be like, yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just don't think you should have people lifting heavy shit and then just let me wander the place on my own. <laughs> 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 this is the future. Apple Watch. If you want to get yourself into a little bit of fitness, get yourself an Apple Watch. Every day it sets you fitness goals for the day. I got up to get a sausage roll from the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and it congratulated me. <laughs> <laughs> It congratulated me on hitting my daily move target. <laughs> oh, I found a fitness program I can stick to. <laughs> I'm just up and down to the bridge all day. <laughs> Five sausage rolls in, you can really feel the burn, you know. <laughs> just for balance, by the way, that joke would also work with a scotch egg and an Android watch. <laughs> <laughs> If you're a fucking loser. <laughs> Got a rivalry in the a rivalry in the tech world. I'm a bit of an Apple fanboy myself. Fully immersed in the Apple ecosystem, fully indoctrinated into their evil, wicked ways. Love it for all the gear. Got the watch, obviously, you know. The phone, you've got to have the phone for the watch. The watch doesn't work well. The phone, the laptop, the desktop, the little Apple TV thing that plugs into the normal TV. But I love it all. The reason I love it is it talks. Everything they make, just straight out the box. I mean, I can use everything Apple makes straight out the box, right? It's not Siri, it's called VoiceOver built into everything they make, right? So on the iPhone, for example, you go settings, accessibility, voiceover, turn it on, don't do it. It changes how you use the phone, and unless you know how to use the voiceover thing, you can't turn it off again, you fuck, right? 
right? <laughs> You're basically on a talking bomb you can't do anything with. Leave it alone, just know it's there, it's amazing. Read everything out, all the news, the apps, the, all the, the texts, the emails. This is how good Apple are. Apple even got into trouble giving little descriptive names to every single one of those emojis of little arms, you know what you're picking. <laughs> you can have a screaming cat face. <laughs> Don't know what I want it for, but I'll just know what you're Purple heart, that's nice, and then you use that a couple of times, lovely purple heart. The default smiley face of choice, the one that everyone goes to is the number one default expression of a smile, uh, specifically for blind people. Apple have called that one smiley face with normal eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not insensitive in the slightest, is it? <laughs> Oh yeah, smiling face, but not for you, Blinky. <laughs> you want smiling face with sunglasses, mate? That's what you want. <laughs> Before I had one of these, I had the old dumb phones, as we all did of a certain age, you know. I was dumb with the dumb phones. I couldn't go out with them because he didn't talk, you know. So like for years. Like I, I couldn't do the um, I couldn't do the, the, the text messages on it. I couldn't do the contact list on them. I could only ever dial numbers on the actual keypad, right? So for years I could only ever phone like seven people because I thought it was <laughs> And then it was about twenty years ago. I got I think it was like a Nokia N97 or something. It was the first phone I got. There was this separate little bit of software you could get. You could load it onto the phone and it gave it like this little Stephen Hawking type voice, right? And for the first time I could do the contact list. I could phone more than seven people. I could do the text messages, it would read them out. I could type them with the old two to two five five six 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 way. It was amazing, it was beautiful, it was liberating twenty years ago. Me, one of my closest mates, Gary, chunky ginger Geordie lad, met him at uni, still one of my closest mates to this day, like me and him. We're in a bar, we're having a beer, we're single, fancy free in our twenties, right? Got my brand new phone in my pocket. Finish our drinks. Gary goes over the bar, doesn't he, to get some more drinks. And while he's over there, this girl comes over and she starts chatting to us. And we're having a nice little chat, having a laugh, having a giggle. Ha ha ha. Gary's over there. He must look over and see me talking to this girl over the other side of the room. Next minute, me phone pings with a text message. <laughs> It was still new, it was exciting, so I took my phone out of my pocket and in front of the girl I pressed the button for it to read the text and in a Stephen Hawking voice it just said, No. <laughs> That's using your phone for Tinder before Tinder was a thing. That's having your mate swipe left for you from across the room. Oh, but Chris, how did you cope with dating when you couldn't see anything? Well, you have one very good friend, he's in charge of quality control. <laughs> 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 Makes it sound like arseholes, doesn't it? But we were. <laughs> <laughs> tell you this, right? We all have the love hate relationship, don't we, with the, with the technology? I rely on it, I do everything to it, like, but I, you know, I, I, I had to buy a new iPhone. My iPhone broke, right, the one before this. I was furious, because I heard it break, first of all. It made a noise. It went like that, like a little noise. And it bricked as the lingo goes. So I just couldn't do anything with it. I was furious, it was only just out of his warranty. I'd looked after it and everything. I had to take it to the Apple store, right? The geezer, the genius, plugged it into his gizmo. He goes, uh, it's uh, telling me that the audio circuits are fried. What do you mean the audio circuits are fried? They can't just fry, can they? It's only just out of his warranty. I've looked after it and everything. And he pulled the little SIM tray out on the side. And there's like a little detector in there, apparently. And he goes, uh, it's uh, telling me it's got water damage as well. It's got water damage. It's waterproof. <laughs> you advertise it as waterproof. That's not on, is it? It's only just 
I've wanted to have looked after it and everything. And he goes, well, uh, you can't look after it that well. It's like a crack in the screen. It's like, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know I was there, did I? Didn't know I left to stand up, had to buy a new phone. Graham, who showed me out here, I was moaning to him. I said, crack in the screen, don't know when that happened. Water damage, how the hell does that happen? And he goes, well, maybe the water damage has got something to do with the fact that whenever your phone's dirty, you wash it under the tap. <laughs> 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 And I do, because it's waterproof. Yeah. But evidently, only if there isn't a big fucking crack in the screen. <laughs> really, what I was doing to dump it onto me was just massaging water through the front of the iPhone. <laughs> so what I'm saying, I suppose, is the technology's amazing, but it's only as good as the blind dick in this washing. <laughs> <laughs> I tried meditating, didn't I? I've got that headspace thing. I tried, I tried it in the lockdown, because like, I, tried, I, I wanted to kind of de-stress a little bit. I wanted a little bit of inner calmness, make myself a little bit easier to live with. It was hard, wasn't it? Like, I don't care how good you think your marriage is, how solid you think your relationship is. It was hard, wasn't it? Under each other's feet every single day, I swear. The kettle boiled louder when my wife put it on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you have to have another cup of tea? You just had one yesterday. <laughs> Can't you have a juice? It's quieter. Pour it on an angle so I don't have to hear it gluck. <laughs> so I thought I'd get meditating the cold, right? Now look, right? I'm not normally into woo, right? I'm not usually into weird shit. But ten years ago, I'd never heard of hummus, and now I eat it all the time. <laughs> I'm not sure it existed ten years ago, but it's everywhere now, isn't it? I and mean, we don't quote me on this, but I think it was invented by Waitrose. <laughs> <laughs> and so as a man who now eats hummus, openly, <laughs> I thought I'd give meditating a go, or as I call it, Boring yourself to sleep. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it every time I tried. I just wake up in the chair an hour and a half later. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'd done it. <laughs> Did I fall asleep before I did the meditation? Or was I at least halfway through a meditate when I fell asleep? <laughs> the thing I was listening to said, Don't worry, if you fall asleep, doesn't mean you're not doing it properly. <laughs> In which case, I've been meditating at least once a day. <laughs> For the last 40 odd years. Oh, when I was a baby, my mum said I was a proper meditator. <laughs> I wasn't shit in my pants, I was meditating. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't, like, has anyone meditate? <laughs> <laughs> Three people are definitely um, maybe a lot of people that are right now. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a real thing. I'm not convinced it's a real state of mind. I think maybe, at best, the best you can hope for is competently pretending to meditate, maybe. I mean, does anybody ever meditate purely for the benefit of meditation alone? Is there anybody that meditates? that hasn't told everyone they know that they do. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't empty my mind of all thoughts. That was step one. That's a big step one, isn't it? Empty your mind of all thoughts after sitting down. Closing your eyes. I even done that. I didn't want to think that I was cutting corners. <laughs> I was balls in committed. And then empty your mind of all thoughts. You can't, can you? It's impossible. Because even if your mind's empty, you're thinking, I've got an empty mind. <laughs> I'm not thinking anything, I've done it, I've done it. I'm not 
thinking anything except for this. I mean, I'm thinking this, but surely I've got to be allowed to think this. <laughs> Otherwise, how would I ever know that my mind is empty? <laughs> This is what I said. Fucking nonsense, by the way, but this is what I said. <laughs> you should come and keep your mind empty. So picture the scene. You sat there. Your mind empty for the time being. Your eyes are shut. You're in the flow. This is what it said. These were the instructions. It said, if a thought should come along while you're meditating, it said, first of all, acknowledge the thought. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> just meditating because you come back in five minutes. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, do us a favour, thought. If I am asleep and you get back, you couldn't break us up because you. <laughs> It said, thank the thought for coming. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't say whether you just think this in your head or whether you're meant to be like, thank you. <laughs> this is the bit that stuck with me though. Very particular choice of language, very peculiar choice of language. I'll quote it for you. This is what it said. It said, take the thought. Take the thought. I think this is the visualize in your own mind, the process of clearing your mind out again. Imagine you're in there yourself. It said, take the thought. It said, put the thought in an empty room on its own. It said, close the door, lock the door, and throw away that key. <laughs> now your mind is empty again. Oh. But it's not, is it? <laughs> Thinking there's a room with a thought in it. <laughs> a fucking room. What was that? An empty room with a thought. Oh shit! I didn't even check if it was empty, did I? <laughs> I was too busy grappling with the thought. I think I might have put it in a half full room. <laughs> you know, if you go back and check, I might be like, where the bloody keys go? Where is my car? Could have just dropped it. <laughs> that didn't work for me. It didn't make me easy to live with anyway. Right. Me and my wife, we've, um, we've been together for 17 years and um, we've got, we got one, a little girl at home, one child. I mean, my daughter's called Sophie, which um, I, I think is a wife. So we'll agree on that. It's hard, I, it's, a, it's hard picking a name isn't it, for a kid because there's two of you. That's the problem. <laughs> I think picking a name for a kid might possibly be the only thing in the world that single mums have got easier than couples. Because <laughs> it's hard being a single mum, isn't it? Except for picking a name, because there's one thing you can pick it, you go, that will fucking do you, move on to that. <laughs> the best name I have ever come across on a real life human being is equally the best name and the worst name. And admittedly, it's only even slightly the best name because it's just entirely the worst name. <laughs> it was an American lady who worked with my best, best mate about seven or eight years ago in the IT department of a leading pharmaceutical company just outside London, right? That bit's irrelevant, but I just wanted the sentence to be longer. <laughs> it builds the tension. She was an American lady and her name was Fanny Gravy. It's <laughs> wonderful! <laughs> and it's horrific. <laughs> it is magical. <laughs> and it is wrong on how so many levels. <laughs> Fanny Gravy. Spell G R A. B-I-E, but I don't give a shit, that's still fucking gravy. <laughs> you can hire Synth Bouquet the shit out of the <laughs> And I was telling somebody about this, just two of us, 
Just the two of us. I think it's hilarious. Family crazy, mostly lads, right? Just two of us, me and one other person. I'm telling them the story. I build the tension. I get to the big name reveal, and I said to them, and you'll never guess what her name is, Banny Gravy, ha 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 ha, and they didn't go with it at all, they just shot me down. They went, yeah, 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 Chris, whatever, whatever, but you've missed the point, haven't you, eh? Because she's American, isn't she? And in America, Fanny doesn't mean you're Fanny, does it? Fanny means you're bum. <laughs> <laughs> across the room and they said to each other, let's call them bum gravy. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we stuck on one child. Conscious decision. Do you know when you meet someone and they've just had a second kid and they're safe here, oh God, it's so much harder than the first one. If this had been the first one, they'll tell you, I don't think we'd have done it again. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was our first one. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't do it again. <laughs> and my daughter said to me, during the lockdown, she said to me, she said to me that she was sad because she didn't have a little brother or a sister to play with. She actually said to me that she felt sad because she was lonely, because she didn't have a little brother or a sister to play with. I mean, what do you do with that as a parent? How do you take the weight of that sadness from a child and hold them and tell them that it's all their fault? <laughs> <laughs> You basically traumatised mommy and daddy <laughs> for an entire year. We can't go near each other anymore just in case it happens again. <laughs> Honestly, for years now, me and my wife would just sit in bed next to each other with a clear foot of space between us all the time. Just both individually playing on our iPhones until we fall asleep. <laughs> Most intimate we get is that we somehow connect via Bluetooth, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> just airdrop or a dick trip. <laughs> Only problem is I never know what camera I've got selected, so usually it's just me smiling down. <laughs> <laughs> I was never like, you know, I was never like a sex machine, no. <laughs> I was not even in the heyday. I was never like a geezer. I was never like a lead, you know, lead. I was on a train, proper lead, back that way, across the aisle, behind me. Loud, they were loud. One of them, big gob on him, big gob, holding court, he was boasting to his mates about yesterday's sexual exploit. How it had drained him of the energy that he evidently needed to be a proper fucking block for that day. Fucking <laughs> knackered this morning, lads, knackered. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday, that bit burned, that bit burned. We shagged 11 times. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> 11, 11, I can only imagine he was counting in binary. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's great. I mean, 
the record is more than once, but it's definitely less than twice. <laughs> Consistently fall between the two. <laughs> the thought was difficult, though. It was very difficult. The, I'll tell you this, right? The entire first year of my daughter's existence was awful. <laughs> She was difficult from before she even existed in this outside <coughs> world. The labour was 41 hours. Oh, it was horrific for me. <laughs> <laughs> Started at 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. It lasted to quarter past one in the morning. On the Tuesday, 41 hours and I was awake through the whole thing. <laughs> At least my wife had a bed and drugs I would have killed her either one of them. <laughs> it wasn't wonderful as I was promised it would be. It was a magical experience I was expecting. It was like a Freddy Krueger movie. <laughs> the best part of two days. At no point since has my wife ever said, you know what, I wish we videoed that so I could watch it back. <laughs> Started off, she was facing the wrong way. The baby, not my wife. <laughs> <laughs> back in front of the Then she did a period in there, which is really bad. They have to sort out straight away, like an emergency thing. And then she got the cord wrapped around her neck. Oh, she was a fucking calamity. <laughs> I was in a good mind to send her back and make her do it again properly. <laughs> you know what I don't understand? I don't understand why anybody would ever choose to have a baby <laughs> at home. <laughs> why? Why would you do that? Why would that ever be the sensible... Like, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how easy it's going to be, or how difficult it's going to be. We didn't know what was going to happen. Turns out we needed every single one of those machines that they had in that hospital. And I'll tell you this, we didn't have any of them at home. <laughs> <laughs> the closest we had was an espresso. <laughs> This is the big problem though. This is the big problem that I encountered. It didn't happen in the room itself, it happened outside the room, figuratively speaking, as a boat. I think this happens more now than it used to, right? I think more so now than in the past, when couples settle down, they will tend to do so more often now away from where they, they grew up, right? So more now than in the past, when couples start a family together, they might not have that extended family support network around them, right? So I think a lot more couples now than in the past, when they have that first kid, they will tend to join these NCT kind of pre-birth courses, right? These NCT groups. And you join for two reasons. The first reason you join is how they sell it to you. So you can learn about childbirth from a professional. That's how they sell it to you. But I think the main reason people join these, these groups is, is to create that, that network around them. So they can meet other couples living in their local area who are all having babies at the same time. And the only thing you've really got in common with them all is the fact you've all got your leg over about the same time as you hit it. you're all the best of friends. Yeah. Like manufacturing friendship with two or three hundred feet. That's what it is. And this is the problem that I encountered with the NCT group. It's the only thing the 41 hours does to you in here is it just makes you hate anyone that gets it done quicker <laughs> or easier than 41 hours 
And in the real world, that's not an issue. You've got time to get over that shit. You've got time for the psychological stars to heal. Not in the NCT world. Not when you've surrounded yourself with all these other bloody couples that you barely know, all having their babies at pretty much exactly the same time. They're all sending around their own little update messages to the group with photos that say things like, hey guys, introducing little William. Can you believe he arrived so quickly? We didn't even have time to get into the birthing pool. Fuck off with your loose vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, just take your coronated baby and your massive bunny and fuck it through. Forty one hours. The only thing I got from joining this NCT group was envy and loathing of people I barely knew. And the only thing I learned was take sandwiches. That's the only thing. <laughs> The only nugget of information I took away from that whole course was when the woman in charge, Barbara, that was her name, Barbara, I remember sat there in that living room, Barbara, I think we're on lesson eight of eight by this point, and Barbara is probably scraping the bottom of the barrel for shit to tell us about babies for our money by this point. And Barbara, this is what she said. She said, well, you just never know what time of the day or night they've been having the baby and what they've made a bit of dog food would be at the time in the hospital. So if you're at home, she says, if you're at home, you get the early signals, the early signals, the early compassion. Why not be prepared, make some sandwiches, and take the sandwich. <laughs> I remember sitting there thinking, Barbara, that is a fantastic idea. <laughs> of all the shit you told us this last eight weeks, that is the one thing I am going to take away from this whole goddamn course. And so we were at home, and my wife started getting the early twinges, the early contractions. So I thought, I know, I'll make some sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> so I went into the kitchen, and I made sandwiches, and I took the sandwiches. I didn't take 41 hours worth of sandwiches. <laughs> I just took sandwiches, regular sandwiches. Three hours in, I thought, well, surely that would be the perfect time to have the sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> 38 hours without sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's possible to go 38 hours without sandwiches, especially when you've just had sandwiches. <laughs> but imagine going 38 hours without sandwiches when your whole game plan was sandwiches. <laughs> I walked into that hospital with the confident swagger of a man who'd been on a course and brought sandwiches. <laughs> Within three hours, I flung it. <laughs> but then there she was, this rubbery little creature. <laughs> she felt weird, she felt rubbery. I know that, because they made me cut the cord. I, I, I said, I, I can't. They said, you can. <laughs> I said, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you can. I said, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you can. I remember thinking, do you know, I know there tend to be staff shortages in the NHS. <laughs> but this takes a piss. <laughs> I did. This rubbery little creature. That I was now 50% responsible for keeping alive. <coughs> I don't know what the ladies are thinking. 50% Chris! <laughs> Legally, according to the courts, the law, 50% of 
50%. I know no practically 50%. I know practically most of it falls squarely at the feet of a new moon. We are the Debbie McGee to your Paul Daniels, really. <laughs> That's right, I've got all the current reference points. Right? <laughs> Our job is to just smile and hand your shit when you ask for it. And I don't know how you do it. Honestly, it's remarkable to witness. New moon. You just go into mum mode, you know? It's like you've got a switch on your head that you just flick and suddenly you're in mum mode. It might be difficult, it might be exhausting, but you fight through the depression, you fight through the exhaustion. This baby did not sleep through the night until three days before its first birthday. So it's like everything about Panama Bay. So <laughs> more shit on the walls. <laughs> Can you, you try to open the baby's arse and your eyes should. <laughs> <laughs> I might not bless that sky moon. That man's baby got shit on her head. But new moons, you fight through the depression, you fight through the exhaustion. I was exhausted, the difference was, I fell asleep every single time I sat down. <laughs> like I had a switch, but mine was on my arse, did you turn me up? <laughs> every time I landed on a cushion. <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit it, but I found myself taking gigs that just weren't financially worthy. <laughs> Surely on the basis that they came with a hotel. <laughs> she wouldn't, she wouldn't get oh, up, well, she wouldn't come out, she wouldn't sleep, she wouldn't eat, she wouldn't feed. My wife wanted to breastfeed, she wanted to go through that process. She wanted to have that bonding experience with the baby. The baby didn't give a shit. <laughs> oh, to explain to a baby what you wanted to do, is it? The hospital, they have positions. No, they have a rubber ball, we say. Hold the baby like a rubber ball. Under your arm, like a roll of carpet, but the legs are at the back, the bum's at the side, the head comes around the side of the boob, that way, on the boob like that. That's the rugby ball. They said that'll probably work, that didn't work. They said, try dangling the baby upside down. <laughs> so it comes over the top of the shoulder that way, over the top of the boob that way up, on the boob like that. He said, that'll probably work, that didn't work. Uh, leave the baby the right way up, dangle your wife upside down. <laughs> <laughs> my idea, I was on the couch ready. <laughs> she was having none of it, she was having none of it, right? So, Barbara. <laughs> She recommended that we go and see a friend of hers who was a lactation consultant. Oh, that's a proper fucking job, apparently. <laughs> Only £150 to spend an hour in the company of the maddest, backiest, most skipping old woman <laughs> you have ever met in your life. Her name was Pillary. That's how she spoke. Pillary. I am a pig-headed, stubborn northerner. I resented every single moment of it. I resented being dragged there by my wife with 150 pounds cash in my pocket. I resented sitting there on the mad old woman's couch while she cackled on about how it's not just me and my wife that have been traumatized. She said the baby has also been traumatized. She said to me, you need to go home. Recreate the bird! I said, you want me to fucking walk? <laughs> 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 oh, <my God. laughs> How far up? <laughs> You need to go home, 
I don't know, Daisy, I haven't got a word for him. Because <laughs> he's a bull, isn't he? He don't know where a motorboat is. He's never been out on the water. He don't know where to go. Lives in a landlocked field, doesn't he, poor little fella? What a weird place to have an interval. <laughs> Conservation of a pendulum for that. <laughs> the 
Just roll that dial down on the thermostat. <laughs> <laughs> Do situation now, I know for a fact that like you know me, me being blind means that there are lots of shortcomings that I have as a husband that are extra on top of the lots of shortcomings I have as a husband. <laughs> <laughs> things you can't do together, things you can't share together, things that maybe she saw herself doing and having when she was settled down and married that she just didn't have and will never have in this relationship. Like, of, like she can't share the beauty of her home city with me. Like by all accounts, Rio de Janeiro is a very beautiful city in part. <laughs> <laughs> Intricate mosaic paper, all the vibrant colours, the nature, the mountains, the Atlantic Ocean lapping against the golden sands, all those beautiful sexy bronze bodies running up and down on the beach, the big pervy Jesus punching it. <laughs> 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 Beautiful, stunning, psychedelic. I don't get any of that. And I'm not saying I can't enjoy going to places and people's company and, and activities. Of course I can. I'm just saying that when you're sat there in the dark, it becomes a lot more difficult to just passively soak a place up and enjoy just being there for what it is around you. So we experience it very differently. She can't share that same appreciation with me, right? We don't go to cinema together anymore because we've just grown to like very different films. You know, she loves all those big, high-budget Hollywood CGI-filled blockbusters with the death-defying stunts and the long, drawn-out action sequences that are devoid of all dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I used to like them films when I could see them, but these days, give me a courtroom drama. <laughs> or a film about two blokes trapped in a lift any day of the week. <laughs> She tried me to watch one of the Marvel, the Marvel films. What a pointless night that was! <laughs> Two and a half hours of nothing but explosions <laughs> and bullets and bang, set to classical music. I might as well have stayed at home and put the knives and forks in the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> Never been skiing together. Couples do that, don't need to go on skiing holidays together. I'd probably kill myself and a family of four of mine looking behind themselves. <laughs> we can't go and walk around an art gallery together and admire the paintings and discuss the clever usage of perspective and shade. She can't take me to watch the ballet with her, so it's not all bad. <laughs> Children's fancy dress for adults, really, isn't it? <laughs> a marvel, a marvel. Action sports with a real butterfly. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm at peace. I'm at peace with all these limitations. Because all these things were just part of me when she met me, right? And she, as a grown adult woman, made a conscious decision to spend the rest of her life with me through sickness and in health, till death it was part for the time period according to the statistics. <laughs> <laughs> Becoming a dad is a whole different kettle of fish, right? Because 
Like no, nothing made me more aware of my limitations than becoming a dad. Because I knew going into it, there was going to be loads of stuff that I wouldn't be able to do either properly, if at all, right? And I know that part of the journey for all new parents is literally just flying by the seat of your pants. You figure it out. You haven't got a clue what you're doing half the time. You're learning on the job. Figure it out as you go along. All new parents will get away with some learning further down the line. There'll be something going to kick you in the arse and you're not expecting it. Get a bad good look one day, get a bad look the next. That's how it works, right? Just to balance the whole thing out and create an equilibrium. For example, my daughter's first words would go away. <laughs> I swear on my life. That's all she said for about three months. Go away, go away, go away, go away, go away for three months. That's all she said. And it is so early in her development. I don't even think there were words to it. It was just like sounds that she learned to mimic. Like goo goo gaga, ma ma da da. Go away, go away, go away. Why? Because that is what me and my wife used to say to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we had to feed my daughter, multiple times a day, for week after week after month after month, I was getting the food out, I was taking the food over to my daughter, I was always dropping shit on the floor, the dog was the game, the dog was all over that, right? <laughs> <laughs> the dog was working the perimeter. <laughs> come on, drop to me, my prick, come on. Come on. <laughs> Out in the street, she was just go away, go away. <laughs> People would come up, oh, what a beautiful baby, go away. <laughs> <laughs> I said to me wife, it's a good job we weren't telling our dog to fuck off. <laughs> before they're even talking, right? Because you don't know what that first thing is that's gonna go in there and stick. And when they're that age, you just, you're exhausted, you're hanging on by a thread. You constantly just fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> so we were lucky, we got away with it, right? But the flip side of that is, it also doesn't matter. You can be good as gold. You can watch every single thing you say every day. Every syllable that leaves your lips you can pass it through a network of door filters before you allow it to do so, and there will always be something. Something you didn't see coming. Something just wants to kick you in the arse because you're not expecting it. <laughs> like this game. This game. I invented this game. I was very proud of it. I played it with my daughter when she was about three years old in the back. It's called Washy Washy Bum Bum. <laughs> <laughs> This is how I used to wash the golden bum in the back. I'd go, come on, sweet dad, time to wash your bum. Washy, washy, bum, bum. She'd get all excited and giggling. She'd jump up in the back. I'd get some soap on my hands. I'd go, washy, washy, bum, bum, wash that big bum, bum. But I wouldn't wash her bum. I'd wash her belly. I'd pretend that I thought that was her bum. I'd go, look at that big bum, bum. Washy, washy, bum, bum. She'd look down, she'd go, that's not my bum bum. So then I'd pretend I'm looking for it, wouldn't I? I'd go, where's your bum bum gone? Is it under your arm? Wicky wong! Washy washy bum bum! You've got two bum bums! Wicky wong! Washy washy bum bum! She'd laugh, she'd giggle, it was adorable. Until you're at a children's birthday party. <laughs> I don't think you've never met before. <laughs> it's half past five at night, isn't it? It's time to go home. Come on, sweetheart, time to go home. Let's do bath time. <gasps> and you're going to do wiggly wham in my bum bum. <laughs> <laughs> washy, washy bum bum died there and then. <laughs> Being a parent is a new parent is stressed. You fly by the seat of your pants. You get away with something one minute further down the line, and something went to kick you in the arse to balance the whole thing out. But over time, 
those parents that care will show improvement, right? Just like I'm sure that I have shown improvement in many aspects of being a parent over the years, right? But on top of all of that, I knew there was going to be loads of stuff that like no amount of care or effort or love would allow me to progress that or improve that. Like there'd be a glass ceiling pinning me down, stopping me from doing the things that I knew I needed to do as a dad, right? Because I saw being a dad as like a job with very specific dad duties, duties that I wouldn't be able to fulfill. And if I'm honest with you, I felt sorry for myself for a while, but I felt guilty for my daughter because this was going to be her loss, not having a proper dad who could do proper dad stuff with her, right? Because like, we might be white, right, adults choose who they want to be with, whereas kids just get lumped with whatever parents they get, don't they? And you can guess what people would say to me, because you probably say the same thing to somebody in your circle in the same situation, you know? People would say to me, oh, Chris, don't, be, don't worry about it, you'll be great, because all the child really wants is for you to be present and engage with them and love them unconditionally, right? And I appreciate the sentiment. You know, and maybe that is on a very basic level all a child needs, but it's not all a child that deserves, is it? Like a child deserves a dad who can take them to the fairgrounds and put them on all the rides or take them to the farm and point out all the animals. Do you know what the farm is to me? Just a series of fences over which are different smells of shit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no idea, sweetheart, for it smells worse than the last one. <laughs> Let's just call it a donkey and move on, shall we? <laughs> Child deserves a dad who can take them to the park and kick a ball around with them without destroying people's picnics. <laughs> what use is a dad who's colouring in his worse than your own? <laughs> What use is a dad who can't play hide and seek for you without the very realistic possibility that you might die of dehydration? <laughs> <laughs> While you're waiting for him to find you. Because we did play hide and seek. We played hide and seek for like, maybe she, she was four years old. At a push, maybe at a stretch, four years old. And we stopped because she got bored. Because <laughs> it was a farce. This is I can see. We play outside because we live in a flat. We've got a big, massive communal garden at the back. We play out there. This is, this is I can see. She'd run off and hide because she never ever figured out that she didn't actually need to hide. Just <laughs> <laughs> even be quiet, really, didn't she? And she couldn't have held the breath to stay there. <laughs> She'd run off an eye, and then the game was I'd have to follow the sound of the giggling to where I found it, behind a tree. And then I'd slowly chase the giggling back to where we started from. And then she'd say to me, okay, daddy, your time to hide now, daddy. And I'd say, well, I can't, can I swig up? Because I don't know where to go and hide, because I can't see where to go and hide. <laughs> so I can't go and hide, can I? And she'd say, that's okay, daddy. I'll show you where to hide. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember this one occasion. At maybe just about the age of four years old. And she took me in and she guided me across this vast communal garden. At maybe just about the age of four years old. Over to this tree where she'd been hiding. And just as we approached the tree, there was this bird table stuck in the ground. Came up to here, egg eyes, nose eyes. I'd lived in that flat for 10 years by this point. I had no idea there was a like, fucking bird table <laughs> Until she walked me full pelt into the sand. <laughs> Knocked the sense out of me. Knocked the wind out of me. And when I'm batting an eyelid, she just took me out. And ever so gently, she placed it around the far side of the tree where she'd been hiding. And she looked up at me and she said, I hid here, Daddy. I didn't walk into that, did I? <laughs> like that was my fault. But she wasn't the one entirely in charge of the safety of both of us. At maybe just about the age of 40 years old. Because she'd forget all the time, right, that I couldn't see anything. She, all the time she'd forget. And that's fine, isn't it? Little kids are allowed to forget things. But the number of times she'd run into the living room just demanding that immediate attention that immediate approval that little kids thrive on 
you know? She'd run into the living room just shouting, look at me, daddy! And I'd have no choice but to just go, yeah! I just know she didn't have like a carrier bag on her head. Yeah! Keep doing whatever that completely random potentially lethal activity is. Woo! Build your confidence first, health and safety second, sweetheart. <laughs> Because the truth is, right, that I haven't got the faintest bloody clue what's going on around me most of the time. Right? <laughs> and it's weird if you think about it. Because if you think about it, like we can all hear so much more than we can see. We can hear in 360 degrees. <coughs> you can't see in 360 degrees. Even the girl from the exorcist can't see what's in front of her. <laughs> and she's looking behind her. We can hear what's above us, below us, without moving our heads. You've got x-ray hearing. You can hear two things. You can hear like a train a mile away in the distance from inside a building surrounded by walls. All you can really see is what's in your direct line of vision and not obstructed by something else, right? And we're always listening. You can't just close your ears like you can your eyes. Not without sacrificing a couple of fingers, right? <laughs> and so it's remarkable to think that in spite of the abundance of sound that we are constantly and passively absorbing from all directions, just our little stock at home in the larger practical world when compared to that much smaller visual window that we all rely on so heavily. And even then, the usefulness of what we can hear depends on other factors like context, which often comes down to visuals anyway, or environmental conditions, like sometimes there's way too much noise for any of us to make any sense, like, like trying to cross a busy road junction, especially in the rain maybe, or a nightclub or a concert, and then at other times, like now for example, I've got nothing except for the sound of my own voice. <laughs> You're still there, thanks for letting me know, because you're right. <laughs> because I'm a needy comedian, right? I've been doing this for years, right? And I need laughter. It's the only form of approval that I get from an audience. I mean, first of all, if you're one of them people that just comes out and smiles at the comedian, you might as well fucking stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Although you have all the tickets, I'm very glad you come next week. <laughs> But I need laughter. It's the only form of approval I get from an audience. So purposely taking a step away from going for a laugh in order to explain something that might be a little bit more interesting or offer a little bit of an insight, right? It puts me on edge, right? Because I can't see even whether anyone down the front here looks remotely interesting, right? And I am a victim of my own psyche. Right, because I do imagine what's going on around me all the time. It's always going on in here. It's not a conscious thing. I don't try and conjure it up in my head. It doesn't take effort. It doesn't take energy. Maybe because I did used to be able to see. My brain still tries to function visually. And it's always going on in here. You know? And I, I live in a fantasy world. Because the world in here is not the way the world is out here. I mean, the world in here, for a start, depends on my mood at any given time, whether I'm feeling happy, sad, confident, stressed, or panicked, and then it's built on assumptions and deductions based on what I can hear and smell and feel and taste. And then all the gaps are filled in with pure flights of plausible imagination. And I am wrong about everything. <laughs> I mean, just to break it down to something really, really simple, right? If you can, just close your eyes for 20 minutes. 20, 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Picture in your head, just a cup in your hand, a mug, a red mug. Picture a red mug in your hand, right? And you put it on the just the corner of a white table, and you let go. Picture it in your head. You can see it there in your head. You know how big it is because you've just been holding it. You know where it is on the table because you just put it there. And you know that the handle's pointing off to the right maybe because that's how you put it down. You can see it there in your head. You can picture it this red mug. But you're probably wrong about the shade of red. But then some of these is hard, like fire engine red. 
You go up to Hanover, it's, I guess, they close it. But then you're probably wrong about the fact it's just coffee on the side in yellow, but it's got a green angle or something, because no one ever thought to tell you that information. And you didn't think to ask a specific question if there's a turn thing on the side, did it have a different colored handle? Now that might be insignificant information, you know? But you take that scope for error on something as small and insignificant as a cup that you've just been holding, that you know unequivocally is there, and you expand that scope for error out to envelop the whole world around you at any given time, from steps and curves and shop windows and benches and fences and trees and bushes, clouds, birds, buses, cars, dogs, and people. I'm wrong about everything in multiple ways, all the time. Like even now, for example, like, like you lot down there, I'm not just picturing black in the air, I kind of imagine some kind of vague assembly of an audience down in front of me, and I'm wrong about every single one of you. I mean, I know for a fact there's no way that you ladies have actually come out dressed like that tonight. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> disgraceful, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> I do picture people in my head. When I'm talking to them, I imagine them in my head. When I hear people on things, I picture them in my head. And you all do this yourselves to an extent. You'll be at home, you'll have the radio on, or a podcast, someone will be talking. And you'll picture in your head what you think they look like, the person talking. Not a conscious thing, you don't try and conjure it up. It doesn't take effort, it doesn't take energy. It just pops itself in there of its own accord. It's a little image of what you think this person looks like who's talking. And then one day, you'll see a photograph of the person, or you'll see the person in person, and you'll realize that you were never right, were you? Because people don't sound bald or hairy, do they? <laughs> <laughs> the number of people, the number of people that I did not realize were black is quite frankly astonishing. <laughs> And I can normally judge the whiteness of an audience by how tense this next three minutes is. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Because I think that what I do on an unconscious level is unless a person's name or something within their voice lends a clue to a heritage, I think I just assume that everybody's <laughs> white <laughs> until I'm told otherwise. It wasn't until just four years ago, four years ago at Christmas, that I found out that Louis Armstrong was black. <laughs> One of his songs came on the radio, and the person I was with said something along the lines of, ah, oh, Louis Armstrong, actually one of the most influential African-American musicians of all time. I said, he's more than one now. <laughs> Because when I was young enough to see pre-internet days, I never stumbled across a photograph of the guy. And as I got older and older, and then his music more and more, all just passively absorbing it without paying it too much thought or attention. All I had to go on was that voice, that zap do ba ba do da And now I know he's black, oh my god, does he sound black. <laughs> <laughs> but when I thought he was white, this is the unconscious association my stupid friend made. I think it was that gravelly voice of it. Every time I heard one of his songs, I always pictured him in the end looking like Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> I always imagined this old white dude with a long beard and a top hat. <laughs> the number of footballers that I do not realize are not white. And it's sad that usually the way I learn about the colour of a football in the skin is because they're in the news for being racially abused, right? And wouldn't the world would be better if I never found that information out, right? I'll give you an example. Yeah, some of you might know who he is, but I think most, most of you will do. Uh, Italian international footballer Mario Baratelli played for Manchester City, played for Liverpool. It wasn't until one year after he left my own team that I found out that he was black. And not just black, but like Garnet and Esca black, right? And you think, well, does it matter, Chris? But I think it does, because I used to picture him in my head. When I listened to the commentary, I'd imagine him <laughs> in my head, running up and down on that Anfield pitch. Well, to be honest, he didn't do much fucking running. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this predominantly lazy, muscular, dark-haired, white Italian dude. <laughs> 
and then one day, oh yeah, after we left my own team, I was reading on the internet that people were racially abusing Mario Balotelli on Twitter. I had to ask people, why are people racially abusing Mario? <laughs> why don't they like the Italians? Because <laughs> 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 in my defense, why the hell would you ever just assume that Mario Balotelli was a black man? <laughs> I don't just go around randomly making people black in me head and hoping they get a few of them right from time to time. <laughs> I don't point over the last three or four years that I ever think to myself, well, you know, Boris Johnson's a bit of a cunt, but on a brighter note, at least we've got our first black prime minister. <laughs> yeah. You know why? Because no black man would ever start every sentence with, hold him up, hold him up, hold him up. Hold him up, hold him up, hold him up. Hold him up, hold him up. Every time he talks, hold him up, hold him up. Sounds like you're trying to start the world's poshest petrol lawnmower. Hold him up, hold him up, hold him up, hold him up. But I know it's silly, it's silly to say that I didn't know Louis Armstrong was black and I'd never seen what he looked like, which I hadn't. It's silly, I know that. And it's silly to say that I didn't know Mario Balotelli or a whole host of footballs were black because I've never seen what they look like, which I am. It's silly, I know that. But the other implication of that in my life is I've also never seen my wife. And I've also never seen my daughter. But I'm pretty sure they're not black. <laughs> Put it this way. If I was to get my sight back tomorrow, and I was to open my eyes in my hospital bed after whatever miraculous operation they've been able to perform, and I was to gaze down on my beautiful daughter for the very first time, and it turns out that she is black. <laughs> then when I turn my head 30 degrees this way and look at my wife, she better be fucking black as well. <laughs> I said, well, it's Sophie, isn't it? Of course it is, because it's not just like what she looks like that I've been missing out on. It's all the wonderful, amazing, interesting things that she's done and will continue to do, you know? Start with like the crawling, the walking, the running, the jumping, the dancing, the dressing up, the drawing, the coloring, the smiles, all the smiles. I said, so it's Sophie, isn't it? Of course it is. And my wife said, good. And I feel second good I. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, all right, you can be second then. <laughs> she said, what do you mean, yeah, yeah, all right, you can be second then? I said, well, it just depends, doesn't it? I mean, they'll be counting Mohammed Salah and all of this. <laughs> because Mohammed Salah has been known to do things with a football I can't even begin to imagine inside my head. Every single day of my life, I think I wish I could see me daughter. So many times I've thought, I wish I could see Mohammed Salah. <laughs> no offence to me, wife, but it's not like she's doing anything interesting, is it? <laughs> she said, I can't believe you love Mohammed Salah more than you love me. I said, I don't. I said, I love you both equally this time. <laughs> Love me wife more, but he makes me happier. <laughs> oh, he needs to pull his fucking. 
fucking finger yeah. in the thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 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 I do think it's harder for me wife not to be seen by me than it is for me not to be able to see me wife. Because as, as crass as it sounds, she's one of a thousand like, things I can't see every day. But from her point of view, I am the only person in her world that can't see her. And probably the person she's going to be seen by the most, apart from my daughter, you know. She's never looked at with desire or looked by me. She's never like held in that glance when she walks into a room, you know, I kind of I look through her or slightly past her like a sort of a character <laughs> over one shoulder, you know. She's never on the receiving end of compliments from me about how she looks, because they'd just be empty, wouldn't they? She can't ask me, you know, does my hair look all right? Does this top match these shoes? Does my bum look bigger than this? I mean, how do you answer that? I don't know, sweetheart. I mean, things do tend to feel bigger than they look. <laughs> ask me all the time she used to ask me what I thought she looked like she doesn't ask me anymore because I never had a satisfactory answer for her because in the end I know what she looks like in the end but it's like it's not a photograph I can sit there and describe to her in detail even if I had the vocabulary for it you know it's like I know what she looks like it's like I never saw Louis Armstrong looking like a photograph of Abraham Lincoln. It's more like an idea that that's what he is. Like, there is an image there, but it defies scrutiny. You know, like, imagine trying to describe a reflection in a pond. You know, it's there.